Welcome back to Legislative Watch. Um, we were just speaking about uh, uh, the budget and then we went to education. Back to the budget again. We wanted to uh, visit a little bit about uh, maybe how the Idaho State budget breaks down. Uh, Representative Bowles being on Jake, JFAC, I wondered if you could talk about that, is the, the various categories that you have to address uh, in, in the Joint Committee. In the Joint Committee, we basically set about 100 different budgets or more, depending each year uh, with all the agencies things. But it's always interesting because a lot of people don't seem to understand, you know, why you cut in education or why you have to cut health and welfare. Mm -hmm. Why can't you cut someplace else? Mm -hmm. And so I always try to explain to them, we have to realize the percentage of the budget that each one of those comprises. Mm -hmm. And K-12 is about 50% of the budget, right at 50%. When you add all education, that's higher education, the medical education, this type of thing, and professional technical, you're looking at 65% of our general fund budget goes to education. Okay. Then you want to talk about health and welfare and Medicaid, there's another 20%, so you're at 85%. Then you take public safety, which is adult corrections, juvenile corrections, state police, and the judicial, is another 8 to 9 percent. In the last three to four years, it's been right at 94.3 percent for those three areas of the budget. Okay. So when we start looking at the reductions we've taken, we could do away with all the rest of state government and still not balance the budget. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, we held off. Last year was the first year that for, in the history that we've ever given education less money than they received the year before. And we didn't take them as part of the cuts so like we did everybody else previously too. Yeah. And I'm not saying that, you know, we did that intentionally. We did, you know, because we value education in the state of Idaho. Sure, sure. Well, that's very understandable. I, I remember uh, uh, speaking with uh, Representative Wood in transportation last year and one of the areas where those are dedicated funds, though, is that Strictly correct? Is totally dedicated. So how does that differ from what you have been speaking okay, to? Okay, general fund is, is the tax money. That's your sales tax and income tax, okay? Yes. Dedicated funds are fees, license fees, registration fees, those types of things. Gas tax. Gas tax, yeah. So transportation is that way. Fish and game is all dedicated. So there are some agencies all dedicated. We don't have to worry about raising taxes to fund those at this point anyhow, okay? Right. Uh, one of the things that I remember hearing, though, on transportation is that um, there are, there had been some talk about maybe um, taking a por the portion of sales tax revenues that are derived from the sales of auto parts yeah. and anything that has to do with automobiles um, and putting that into the transportation budget. Has any, that ever gotten anywhere or? <laughs> no. It's been talked about, but it's never gotten anywhere. And there are some states that do that. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay. And it's always an interesting question when you start talking about trying to shift from one area to the other because you do that and then you have to f have a gap to fill. Yeah. You know, two years ago we passed a bill that basically was going to take the gas tax that currently goes to the state police and goes to Parks and Rec and, rec and uh -huh. shift that back over to transportation. Well, then we upset the people in Parks and Rec because that was gas tax money that was coming off of recreational vehicles that paid for trails and such. Oh. And okay. then if you took that money that's in the gas tax now going to state police, that left about a $17 million, 15 to $17 million hole that we'd have to make up someplace else. Yeah. So. And there is a bill this year to eliminate that and put it back. Oh, is that right? So yeah. Oh. Put it back to the state police and to Parks and Recs. Oh, gosh. The fact so, is, the good chairman is sponsor yeah, on that yeah, bill. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, well, in, in, uh, in the remaining time that we have left, uh, I thought maybe we could make this a little bit fr freewheeling. I know there's been some, a couple of topics that have been of particular interest lately. Uh, one is the nullification issue uh, that has come up with regard to uh, what has been broadly called Obamacare. Uh, being imposed on the states, and and uh, uh, Idaho was one of the states that uh, brought suit in the federal district court in Florida. How many states were involved in that, by the way? Uh, about 23. About 23, somewhere in that ballpark. 23. Yeah. Not quite a majority of the states, no. but we did get uh, a ruling on that, I understand. What, uh, what, which was, what was that ruling? Uh, I believe in that particular instance the judge ruled it was unconstitutional because uh, it wasn't severable. In mm -hmm. other words, the part that, uh, that was forcing the people to buy something, 
they had to do it. Yeah. It wasn't severable from the bill, and but they considered that unconstitutional, is my understanding, and therefore it made the whole bill unconstitutional because they couldn't separate it out. Right. Well, nevertheless, uh, Idaho and other states have still proceeded forward, though, with uh, with the nullification procedure uh, on this particular bill, uh, which essentially says that Idaho is not going to participate in, in uh, a federally mandated program. Well, is that kind of what the... Well, it's kind of interesting because the bill started out as a nullification bill, but by the time it finally got cleaned up and everything else and remodeled, I guess you might say, it really was not then called a nullification bill, okay? Yeah. But it, it's, in essence, did the same thing. It just basically said that the various agencies in the state uh, could not take and do anything that would implement the so-called Obamacare. Right. And, and we had something quite similar to that a few years ago when we had the Real ID Act and they was yeah. trying to make our yeah. driver's licenses the Real ID. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there was enough states said, no, thank you, and the mm -hmm. law's still on the books, but the states aren't enforcing it, and that's a form of nullification. Yeah, I guess you don't have to use the N word, the, no. the N -word right? no. is that correct? No. <laughs> is what they say no. to make that happen. But it's just simply a way that the states are protecting the citizens mm -hmm. from an overreaching federal government. All right. And that we have discussed this on this uh, program in times past, that there's a really strong historical precedent for this. It's not something that was just pulled out of the air. No. Uh, you know, dates clear back to the days of Thomas Jefferson and James well, Madison. Thomas Jefferson mm -hmm. wrote the Kentucky Resolutions, I believe it was, that yeah. did this very thing. Mm -hmm. uh, fact is, uh, Madison wrote on it, uh, Thomas Jefferson, even folks like Hamilton that was so uh, nationalistic in his views did say in the Federalist paper, I believe it's 48, that the state still had to protect the people and look after them. Yes. Yeah. So, the, so that the set of checks and balances is not necessarily just confined at the federal level right. among the three branches there, that, the, that there is also a vertical component to that at the state level as well. Well, yeah. the reason for that is this. Who created who? Mm -hmm. The states got together and created the Constitution, and out of the Constitution came those different forms of government. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, should the creature be greater than the creator? And, and you, this is an argument that goes back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth. But I can say one other thing about human nature. How many of us are willing to give up any kind of power that we have mm -hmm. peacefully? Mm -hmm. Doesn't happen, does there, it? There, there doesn't appear to be much of a history of that. No. <laughs> George Washington was probably the greatest example of that that ever lived. And King George said, if he doesn't go at, for the third term and become the king, he's the greatest man that's ever lived, <laughs> pretty near, in language about like that. About like that. Well, George didn't. He went home to Mount Vernon. Right. Yeah. Well, well, um, uh, I know that we have had some discussions in uh, previous years, too, about uh, uh, Idaho being, uh, I know Nevada is called the Silver State, but there's a lot of silver in Idaho as well. Oh. And uh, given what's been going on up north, uh, there have been some things that were introduced about uh, the possibility of uh, Idaho coining uh, silver. Yeah, where are we with that? Is there anything going on with that now, uh, as there was last year? I'm not aware of anything. I'm not aware of anything at this point. No. Okay. Uh, we did create a medallion hmm. yeah. okay. a few years ago, and that's still for sale. Hmm. But it's not a coin that's, that says, okay, it's one dollar. Yeah. It's yeah. one ounce of silver. Yeah, okay. And that, that's, that's all the further that has gotten yeah. so yeah. far. As far as I know. Well, I, th I think uh, in general, I guess, uh, silver, of course, is one of many commodities, one of many minerals, and Idaho also being a strong agricultural state. We're looking at a pretty strong tendency for commodity prices to be increasing right now. And for some reason, food prices have not been counted as part of the, uh, uh, the computer consumer pricing. Well, food and energy. Yeah. 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 And so I'm, I'm wondering how this is going to fare for the state of Idaho being such a strong agricultural and mining state. Uh, what will this do as far as people that are uh, producers in that area? 
Well, I think it has a double, it's a double-edged sword, mm -hmm. okay? In some respects, you know, our agricultural imports are going, or exports are going up, and that's good. Yeah. But on the other hand, if you're a dairyman and you got the price of milk that's dropping a little bit at this point in time, but your feed prices keep going up, yes. then your margin goes away, essentially. Yes. And, and feed prices are going up. That's right. Yeah, they are. Corn's so, making records, alfalfa's making records. So. In, in all of those cases, you can you can benefit from it, but then also your own costs are going up using the very same commodity. Well, yeah. the whole segment of agriculture is not uh, uh, enjoying the benefit of, of the increase in commodity prices. Yes. And now you always say, what's good for one guy is bad for the next guy, okay? That's right. <laughs> well, thank you very much, gentlemen. I appreciate your joining me today on Legislative Watch, and uh, hopefully this has been somewhat educational for the folks out there. And uh, hopefully one of these days you'll be back with us. Thank, Thank you, Alan. You. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Thank you for joining us.